Good evening and salam alaikum. Well, thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's really good to see uh, such a full house. Uh, welcome to this 2018 Ibn Rush lecture. Uh, my name is Hassan Masood and I'm the Muslim Institute's Chair of Trustees. So this is an annual lecture that we do. Um, it's named in honor of one of history's great polymaths and someone with, who might say with very little hesitation chose a life of speaking truth to power. And it is in that sense a real privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, the writer and journalist Mohammed Hanif, who I would say is certainly a worthy, a worthy successor. Uh, Mohammed Hanif is based in Karachi. He's the author of many acclaimed novels. He writes plays. He wrote the script for a feature film called The Long Night, and he writes a regular column from Pakistan for The New York Times. His career trajectory is certainly a very interesting one. It's taken him to the heights of Pakistan's Air Force, where he trained as a pilot, and to the BBC, where he worked as a correspondent and as head of Urdu language broadcasts. The subjects that he tackles are wide-ranging, and, but there's one thread that he returns to again and again and again. Uh, Mohammed Hanif is relentless in drawing attention to the treatment, or I should say the mistreatment, of minorities by both state and society. And just before we were coming, he asked me if I could mention something that he's written more recently, which is called The Baloch, who is not missing, and others who are. The Baloch, who is not missing, and others who are, which is a more, more recent piece of work on that subject. For the Baloch and for the Ahmadiyya, for the Christians, and for Pakistan's Hindus, these are, of course, very, very precarious times. And Hanif's Times columns are not only a window to the denial of justice, but they're also ensuring, I'm pretty convinced, are important in ensuring that lawmakers and policymakers in Islamabad, especially but elsewhere, cannot completely cast aside the rights of their fellow citizens. His signature book, however, is, of course, a case of exploding mangoes, which was published a decade ago now. And as I sat down to write this short introduction, I noticed that the year we're in is the 30th anniversary of the plane crash that killed President Ziaul Haq, the strong man with the menacing smile who ruled over Pakistan for more than a decade in the 70s and the 80s. And for those who lived through that era, the Zia years were the stuff of both tragedy and comedy. A comical variant of Islamic law became the law of the land, the CIA and the State Department played war games, and many satirists, when they could, had a field day. And yet it seems as if the general has had the last laugh because his legacy stalks the nation and the cause of his death remains shrouded in mystery. In a moment, Hanif will speak to us on the topic of hearts and minds and things that are not terror. And after that, we'll have plenty of time for questions and for discussion, for good food and for more chat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ahmed Hanif. Thank you, Hassan Saab. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when Zauddin Sardar Saab asked me to give this lecture at the Muslim Institute, I was a bit scared. My first thought was that how does he know that I'm a Muslim? <laughs> I had barely met him, and we had probably had a drink, most probably an alcoholic drink, most probably a beer which many Muslims believe is only 4.8 to 5 percent haram. <laughs> I was puzzled. Then I thought maybe Muhammad in my name might have given him the idea. I confess, like most beer-drinking Muslims, that I don't think I'm good enough Muslim to deserve this honor. I don't really have much to say to my fellow Muslims. Sardar reassured me immediately that the lecture had nothing to do with Islam, and they have had all kinds of speakers. I could talk about anything I wanted to. I still had my doubts. Why call something Muslim if it's not about Muslims or Islam? It's a bit like calling yourself Royal Geographic Society and then reassuring people that the queen doesn't have anything to do with it or you have no interest in dinosaurs. <laughs> I told him that maybe I can do it the following year. I promised myself that either by the next year I'll become a better Muslim or at least a good enough Muslim to give a speech at an institute called Muslim Institute. I also secretly hoped that they'll either shut down this institute or at least they'll find a better person. Also, 
Like all struggling writers, Muslim or not, I hoped that I would come up with an idea. A friend in London found out about this impending lecture and wrote to me in Punjabi, Islam te hun e vakt aage, meaning that Islam has fallen on such bad times that people like you will give us lectures. <laughs> Basically, to counter his negative image of me, I thought I'll share with you my brief struggle to become a better Muslim and some lovely times that I spent with the lovely men from Tablighi Jamaat. I'm sure many of you know Tablighi Jamaat is big in Pakistan. They are even bigger in Bangladesh. Millions attend their annual congregation. I'm told it's bigger than Hajj and way more fun. <laughs> they are men who volunteer their time to preach Islam. Occasionally, when they can hustle visas, they go to other countries to preach to non-Muslims. Some of them have been spotted in the rainforests of Brazil and at least once in Costro's communist Cuba. But mostly they travel within the country and mostly preach to us. They really are lovely people. You might have seen them in groups with their sleeping bags and pots and pans, with their eyes down, going from city to city, talking in very, very polite terms, reminding us the purpose of our lives, and would it not be better if we spent some of our time contemplating Allah and reminding other Muslims to do the same. They are like Jehovah's Witnesses, but with much better food and shy, almost sexy smiles. I was a teenager, uh, a cadet in Pakistan Air Force, and along with a bunch of friends, I was caught stealing oranges from an orchard. In military terms, the orchard was one of was out of bound for us. Now, as you probably know, stealing is a serious offense in all the armed forces all around the world. I mean carpet bombing your fellow citizens and putting live electric wire to a dissident's testicles are covered under standing operating procedures, but you steal a few oranges and you are in serious trouble. I guess it makes sense. You are being trained day and night to be the defender of the nation, and then it turns out that you are just a petty thief. You can't have that in armed forces. As a punishment, we were not allowed to go on summer holidays. In military terms, we were gated, while all the other trainee officers, the non-thieves, went home. The academy was deserted, and only a bunch of us orange thieves were kept on the campus. But this punishment posed a slight problem for the high command, as their summer vacation was also ruined. We needed to be fed and guarded, and the security around the orange orchard had to be enhanced because, you know, criminals returning to the scene of crime and all that. Now, our adjutant, the man responsible for our punishment and our safety, was an exceptionally good Muslim and a very intelligent one too. You could say that he was a one-man Muslim institute. So he came up with what now they call an out-of-the-box solution. He took us from the academy and handed us over to Tablighi Jamaat people. Now, look at the man's audacity. In one stroke, he came up with an innovative management solution and also scored some brownie points with Allah by sending us off to spread his message. I'm sure under the terms of our handover, he told the head of our Tablighi mission about our offense, but those pious men never ever mentioned that their new comrades were basically a bunch of thieves who had been caught. So we moved into a mosque with the mission. One of us wondered if this was punishment or a reward. We were now supposed to do Allah's work, but the government was still paying our salary. What more could a good Muslim ask for? We were supposed to go from house to house and shop to shop and talk to people about becoming a better Muslim. We were teenagers. We were drowning in our own hormones. We were supposed to keep our eyes down so that we would not get distracted by the women in the bazaar. It was quite embarrassing knocking at the door of a house, and if a woman opened the door, we had to look down and ask in the politest of voices if there was a man in the house we could talk to. We always wanted to ask the head of our mission that if we could have a go at making women better Muslims, but we didn't. But I did ask him a question during a consultation session, though. 
They were very big on consultations, and before entering a street or while planning a meal, we always had a little huddle, like football or cricket players do before the start of a big match. We consulted every five minutes. We were like these tightly knit think tanks. We consulted before the prayers and after the prayers, before going to sleep, and the first thing after saying our morning prayers, always reminding each other how to carry Allah's message to the next shopkeeper. And we were always reminded that we must keep our eyes down. I must have got some confidence after spending a few days in this pious company and lecturing random shopkeepers about what Allah really wanted from them. In one of our huddles, I asked, what was the point of preaching to other Muslims? I mean, how did we know that they were not good enough Muslims? Maybe they were stay-at-home type Muslims or DIY Muslims who didn't want to be bothered by other Muslims. Trust me, I know a lot of them. I said, aren't we preaching to the converted? Yes, I was a very irritating teenager. The head of our team, Tabligh, asked me, have you ever thrown a ball at a wall? Sure, which kid has not done that? Throwing a ball, kicking a ball, catching a ball, hitting the ball into a hole, that's basically the sum total of manhood, Muslim or not. I said, yes, I had bounced a ball off a wall. He said, when you throw a ball at a bo wall, it comes back to you, right? I was still puzzled. What does a rubber ball have anything to do with Allah's work? He said, you see, when you tell someone to become a better Muslim, he may or may not become a better Muslim. But by doing this, you yourself become a better Muslim. A ball bouncing off the wall, coming back to you. I must have looked puzzled and even more irritating. So he said, when you preach to someone that Allah doesn't want us to steal other people's property, the person may or may not get the message, but by saying that, you can convince yourself that Allah doesn't approve of stealing. I guess the man had a point. Since that day, I have never stolen oranges, or for that matter, any kind of fruit. In fact, I have completely gone off fruit. <laughs> An occasional smoothie maybe, but fresh fruits don't do it for me anymore. And I have a young son now, and even he doesn't like fruit. But he does like me to throw a ball occasionally, and whenever I bounce a ball off a wall, I'm reminded that I'm still a struggling Muslim. Decades later, when I was still struggling with being a good Muslim, people around me started disappearing. By all accounts, they were good enough Muslims, but somehow, their brains got corrupted by reading the Quran in translation or by reading bits of Franz Fanon in student study circles or by just listening to bad poetry. Baloch started disappearing first, then Sindhi activists, then Shias, then young men from Karachi, and then God-fearing patriotic citizens of Lahore and my hometown, Okara too. Many of them were political activists, separatists we call them, and the state told us that they were anti-state and not good enough Muslims, and the state also denied having anything to do with their abductions. But amongst the missing, there were lots of people who were very good Muslims, the best kind, who were ready to kill us or get killed in order to make us all slightly better Muslims. Clear-headed men who were in a hurry to get to Allah's promised paradise, and if they had to shoot a teenage girl in the face to get there, then they would just do it they also started disappearing. So we had socialists, nationalists, half-hearted separatists, and world-conquering jihadists all going missing. There were some women too. One girl was abducted and appeared a year and a half later, and before she could tell anybody who had abducted her, she was abducted again. Some non-Muslims, yes, but mostly those who went missing were Muslim and young men. A boy went on a bicycle to say his prayers and did not come back. Another boy was coming out of a mosque when he was picked up by men in plain clothes, as we call them. They always came and still come in a four-wheeler called Vigo. And when they take your boy, they don't leave any tracks. In Urdu, we struggled what to call these people. We said, La Pata Afraad or Gum Shuda Afraad, which basically means lost people. It sounds 
as if they were coming home and took a wrong turn and lost their way and are still out there wandering around asking directions from strangers. That would be a nice fate. But when, when as a journalist, you asked around, you found out what their families already knew. They were, and many still are, in some dungeon. They are being beaten, beaten, no doubt about it. They are also being asked questions, detailed questions by their abductors about the books they read, the friends they hang out with. They are often beaten on the soles of their feet. Some are burnt with cigarettes. Some of them, the hard ones, are injected with drugs that give them hallucinations, and then they are played recorded screams of their mothers, but they are not sure if these are their mother's scream or they are just hallucinating. At least one man told me that qualified doctors are present during these sessions. We in the media in Pakistan pretended that nothing was happening. State dealing with anti-state elements, what have we got to do with it? Then the families of these missing persons started appearing at our, at our doorsteps. I mean, not at our homes, but at our workplaces. They set up camps outside press clubs where journalists often hang out to have lunch or play cards. These families had panaflexes with the names and pictures of their missing ones. We pretended not to see them in these posters. We didn't hear their tired slogans. We tried to carry on our life as normal, but these people disrupted the rhythm of our daily lives by asking the same question day after day. But where is my son? What has he done? What have you done with him? Why don't you put him on a trial? You took him. The whole street was watching when you took him. There is CCTV footage. There are affidavits from neighbors who saw you putting a blindfold on him and taking him away. Now, can't you put him on a trial? And the words that I heard again and again and again, you should tell me if my child is dead. You should tell me if you killed him. You should tell me if you killed him by mistake. You can hang him if he has done something. Hang him in public if he has committed any crimes. But at least tell me where have you kept him. Can I see him for five minutes? A phone call maybe? Can I send him some clothes at least? Or a book maybe? My son is the bookish type. He was the secretary information of a student organization. He became the secretary information because he liked reading and writing. You can hang him, sure, but let me see him once. And there was silence and smirk from the state. Their abductor said, what son? Do we look like kidnappers to you? And as a retired general sahab once said, we don't pick up people, never. But if we pick them up, there must be good reason. It's after all not kidnapping for ransom. Parents must know what their boys are up to. And as parents, we wonder if the general had a point. After all, what do we know about our sons? Sometimes we wonder about our moody boys and their new secretive inner lives. Is my son planning to destroy the world, or is he just stealing a smoke in the bathroom? We also know that once we all wanted to destroy the world and remake it, or at least give it a nice makeover. But then we settled for a mid-level managerial job. So I tried writing up these stories. Concerned colleagues would say, do you know how many are missing? The government said, none. Then the government said 800 or something. Then the organizations of the families with panaflexes with the pictures of the missing said there are 18,000. It turned into a numbers game. Then wise friends expressed sympathy but didn't forget to remind that what? Only 800? A few thousand? You know about Kashmir? Indian occupied Kashmir? More than 10,000. They have a term for the wives of the missing ones. They are called half-widows. Have you forgotten Argentina? More than 30,000. So you were saying 800 or 5,000? Surely not that bad. Only you couldn't give this logic to a half-mother, a half-father, a half-sister, or a half-brother. You couldn't really tell them that they were better off than those wretched people in Kashmir or Argentina. 
I came up with a little pamphlet with the stories of the families of these missing people. It didn't help them. It didn't help me. I came up with a guide for the families of missing people, telling them what to do if someone goes missing. It didn't help anybody. I tried to keep quiet about it. It didn't help. I stopped doing all of that. It became like one of those desperate things that cricket fans do, that if I don't watch for a few overs, a wicket would fall. So for weeks and months, I didn't write about rapidly disappearing people. I even refused to retweet or like the stories about missing people. So in my head, I was trying to disappear the people who had already disappeared. And then friends and other people who were not content about sitting in a nice hall and talking about these things, they went out to protest in solidarity with the missing people, and they went missing too. Now, I felt really bad about the new missing people who had gone missing while protesting for the release of earlier missing people. I relapsed. I ended up in a hall like this in Karachi, not this posh, but around the same size. A father was on the stage whose son had been missing and then his body had been found by the roadside. A bright young woman, an Amphil student whose brother had disappeared. A young man whose uncle was picked up 11 years ago. I was supposed to be moderating the session. The discussion was depressing. One of the participants tried to break it down for us Kratziaites, our sons and daughters safe at home or at math tuitions. He said, some of you have pets, cats and dogs, and sometimes they disappear. What do you do? You go around the neighborhood asking people on the streets, have you seen my dog? You drive around the hangouts that they were attracted to. You print their pictures. You throw in a little reward. You put these little posters on electric poles. You wait for the phone to ring. Surely your cat or dog will return before the shadows start lengthening. Sure, he or she took a wrong turn and is somewhere frantically sniffing for a familiar smell. She is as frantic as you are. If your dog or cat doesn't return by the evening, you'll probably not have your dinner. You'll convince your children to eat, though. You might even pretend to eat with them, but the food will turn into ash in your mouth and you'll start having terrible thoughts. What if your lovely cat or dog has been run over? What if someone stole her? What if she will wander the streets the rest of her natural life and will never find her way back home? Now think about that cat person or dog person. That person is me, said the Emphil student, every single day for the last four and a half years. When will the phone ring? When will somebody knock at my door? The MPhil student was disconstructing this for a well-heeled Karachi audience. And I could tell that the audience was getting extremely uncomfortable. Nice people with nice families don't like to contemplate that something bad could happen to their cat or dog. So while all this cat and dog story was going on, I saw that about half a dozen women appeared at the entrance to the Arts Council auditorium where we were talking. They were holding a large panaflex with a picture of a man on it, release Haji Razak, it said. Razak was a sub-editor at a Balochi language newspaper. He was not a revolutionary, not a troublemaker. He had done a very inventive Balochi translation of a book called The Evolution of Man. His friend said he wanted to be a writer like many sub-editors do. So these women were just standing there at the entrance to the hall. It was quite obvious that they didn't know what to do. They had never been to a protest. They had never been to a meeting about missing people. I wasn't even sure if they knew what a missing person was. It was their brother and their father, Haji Razak, who had just gone to office to sub-edit news stories, and now they were holding a panaflex with his picture on it. I didn't know how to start this conversation about their own missing person, who they didn't want to believe was missing. But they had to do something, and they were doing exactly what the families of other missing persons had been doing for years, print a picture on a plastic sheet and stand. We invited this group in, they folded their panaflex and joined the audience. Our session resumed and we started talking about perils of a security state and the weak legal framework 
that governs the fate of these missing people. One of the newly arrived women raised her hand and stood up. She shouted at us, at the audience, what is going on here? Haji Razak had been missing for 48 hours. We saw the people who abducted him. They came in a vigo. We have been to the police station. They wouldn't even register our case. It was a familiar story, but her anger was fresh. You are all sitting here talking, 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 while my brother has been gone for 48 hours. On the stage, we sat with our heads down. I thought how to reintroduce my panel again. Here is a girl whose brother had been gone for four and a half years. She can't even go to her university because the teachers and students look at her as if it's her fault that every day she has to be at a protest camp holding her brother's picture. Here is a father whose son was gone for three and a half years and then from a missing person he became a dead person with eight bullets in and around his heart and a little piece of paper in his pocket with his name on it. Did you say 48 hours? Nobody said that, of course. Her question was reasonable enough. Reasonable enough. Why were we all sitting in an air-conditioned hall, talking, talking, talking? Why didn't we go out and look for Haji Razak? Why don't we storm the police stations? How come nobody was talking about digging and unearthing those dungeons where these missing people were caged? We went home after the discussion and walked our dogs and hugged our children and tried to forget Haji Razak's family's anger. Razak family's ordeal was relatively brief but eternal. Four months later, I received a message from a colleague. A body had been found on the roadside just outside Karachi on a rubbish dump, badly mutilated like all the other bodies before him. Family had been called in to identify. After having followed dozens of such cases, I was still surprised. This was all too sudden. He'd been gone only for four months. There were people who had been waiting for years, waiting to hear the exact same news that Haji Razak's family had received. Can you please come and identify your man? The family went to a morgue and came back and announced to friends that no, it wasn't Haji Razak. There was relief. It happened sometimes. One of my colleagues was called to identify the body of another colleague who had been abducted from a university in Islamabad. It turned out that it wasn't the body of our colleague. My colleague on the body identification duty had told me that he was ecstatic that it wasn't our colleague's body. Later he said that he was so relieved that he wanted to hug that body. I could understand his relief. Haji Razak's family wasn't so lucky. They were called the next day and told, please have another look. We believe this is your man. And this time, Mrs. Haji Razak went herself and she recognized the body from the tattered shirt she was wearing, he was wearing. It was the same shirt he was wearing the day he was abducted. Apparently, that was one thing on that body that was identifiable. A friend who was reporting the story later told me that he had to change the story thrice for writers. I have to confess that we were following the story so diligently because Haji Razak was a journalist colleague. Every mutilated body brings back a message. And with Haji Razak, we got the message that we should shut up. And we did. But I still wondered, where do they go, these missing people? Why don't they bring back stories? I talked to one former missing person who was lucky. He had been dumped on the roadside, tortured but alive, bruised but grateful. Our conversation didn't last more than a minute. He said, what has happened to me has happened. And I fear that if I talk about it, and even if you don't mention my name, it will happen again. Once in a lifetime is enough, never again. So we stayed silence. But there were more and more young men who were missing and their families were talking and nobody was listening to them. No news channels ran breaking stories, no political parties mentioned it in their rallies. Even citizens, good hard citizens, look away when they saw a bunch of women and men with panaflexes. There's a private university in Lahore, Pakistan. By all standards, 
It's a center of excellence. Its faculty is full of people who have earned their degrees at Ivy League universities or some of the best universities here in the UK. Historians, lawyers, anthropologists, philosophers. The students are the brightest in Pakistan and mostly come from well-off families. It's the best liberal arts education that money can buy in Pakistan. The university is owned and run by some of the richest and most well-connected men and women in Pakistan. This university invited the members of the families of the missing people. They were finally relieved to find an audience. The day before the event, two men in suits claiming to be from an intelligence agency walked into the dean's office and said, no, you can't have this event. I don't know if any of the lawyers or historians at the university asked these men in suits that under what law can you stop a citizen from talking to other citizen at the campus of a private university. The event was cancelled. Sabine ran a tiny art center in Karachi, probably the exact opposite of the Grand University in Lahore. If you get more than 80 people in the hall, you have to practically sit in each other's laps. She said, what the hell? I shall have the same event here. Her logic was simple. We are so small, who will bother with us? 80 people sitting in a room, listening to the misery of our other fellow citizen, what can go wrong? And for about an hour and a half, she was right. The family members of the missing people came, the old man with the missing but now dead son, the Amphil student looking for her brother for four and a half years, a young woman searching for her father. The event was a success. Nobody shouted. The audience and the speakers were all polite to each other. After finishing the event, Sabine was driving home when she was shot dead. The highest authorities in the land investigated and found her alleged killer and convinced the courts and the media that Sabine's death had nothing to do with the silly little event about the missing people. So why was she killed? We were told, oh, the usual, she had short hair. She had been drawing hearts and roses in public places on the Valentine's Day. Basically, she was killed for being not a good enough Muslim. Within days, her picture was added to panaflex carried by the families of the missing people. Some of her friends resented that picture. They blamed the families of the missing people for having used her for their own purpose. As you would expect, there was a long silence after that. If you can be killed for being in the same room with people demanding the return of their abducted sons, then what was the point of talking about such stuff? But occasionally people talked in hushed voices at dinner parties. At a dinner party, a government official put his arm around my shoulder and took me into a corner and said he appreciated all the work that I had done about missing people and said he was also working on the same issue. My first instinct was to tell him that it was all in the past. I had moved on. I was a struggling novelist and had no interest in missing people or their families. I also thought when you end up at a party with a government official who claims to be doing what you have been trying not to do for a while, surely you are at the wrong party. How did you get here? How do you know these people? Are you sharing canopies with a torturer? Maybe they don't administer the torture themselves. They don't take live wires to someone's testicles. But sure, they approve of it. They look away, they hold their nose, and don't talk about it at dinner parties. They put an arm around your shoulder and take you into a corner and want to compare notes. He said, there is one problem with what you have written. What is this, I wondered, a dinner party interrogation? He asked me, how do I know that these people that I keep calling missing people, how do I know that they are alive? What? If they are dead, they are still missing as far as their families are concerned. Why doesn't someone tell their families and put them out of their misery? Because I knew families where young children were told that daddy was away on business year after year, year after year. Definitely he will come for your next birthday. And one five-year-old asks that if daddy is away on business, why do we have so many pictures of him around the house? Or a mother with Alzheimer's was told that her son had gone abroad. Didn't she remember? 
He only called last week. And there are daughters who have grown up while daddy was away on business and are getting married now. And there are 40 guests in the house the night before the wedding, all huddled together, all crying. How are you supposed to behave like a bride when your father is in some dungeon and the house is full of his pictures and posters demanding his release? People tend to forget when you're dead. Time heals, a gravestone, a picture with a garland around it. It doesn't matter if you died young or you died during a torture session. Even if you're found on a roadside with 16 bullets in your body and cigarette burn marks on your back and a little slip of paper in your pocket with your name and address on it, we have some thoughtful torturers. They don't want your tortured bodies to rot on the roadside. Why not put them out of their misery? I asked the man with his arm around my shoulder. He looked at me as if I was being too naive for my age and my experience, as if I was asking him to reveal the secret location of our nuclear assets or something. What would be the point then, he said. I remember then that I had asked the same question from a father whose son had been missing for four and a half years. I didn't have the heart to look at his face and ask him how did he know that his son wasn't just dead. So I kept looking down and kept scribbling in my notebook like responsible reporters are supposed to do. I asked him if he had ever heard about him. Had anybody seen him? I couldn't bring myself to ask, how did he know his son was alive? Has anybody brought any news? Have there been any sightings? He shared two pieces of evidence with me. Once, a lucky missing person returned home and brought a button from my son's shirt, he said. His missing son had taken off a button from his shirt and given it to his fellow inmate and told him that if he ever gets out, he should give this button to his family. This was the old man's proof, a button from his son's shirt. This button kept him alive. And another time, someone else came back and said he had heard him call the azan in his cell. They were all in solitary confinements, and at the prayer time, they would call the azan. We call for prayers, and they would take turns doing it, five times a day. Now, even their abductors and their designated torturers were good enough Muslim, Muslims, so they couldn't stop them. What kind of Muslim can stop other Muslims from calling the azan? But after finishing the azan, after saying the last Allahu Akbar, they would go on and add their name, like a ghazal poet using his name in the last verse of the ghazal. Now people living in their solitary cells knew each other's names, even though they never saw each other. This was clever of them. You shout Allahu Akbar, and then you say your own name. Yes, Allah is great, but what about me? Allahu Akbar, but can't I talk in the, uh, with the other inmates? Allahu Akbar, but can you at least tell me when you're planning, planning to shoot me dead? So this old man had hope because someone returning from that prison had heard his son's name at the end of an azan. The old man was full of hope for many years. And I could see the pride in his eyes that his son, even when missing, even when kidnapped and tortured, was a good Muslim, was calling out the call to prayer five times a day, even when no one was allowed to join him for prayers. He was still calling out the azan and putting it to good use keeping Allah happy and also keeping his father's hope alive. A good enough Muslim, I'm sure we can all agree. As we in the media started to completely black out all news about missing persons, the mutilated bodies, their families' protests, the men who continue to roam around in their vigos and are free to disappear anyone they don't like, something strange happened. These voices started to multiply. There used to be dozens of protesters, then hundreds, and now there are thousands and thousands. The panaflexes carrying the missing person's pictures now cover fields bigger than football grounds. Six-year-old girls make speeches. Young women grab the police from their throats and demand to know, where is my brother? Have you killed him yet? There was encouraging news over the last weekend. Pakistan's Chief Justice took notice of the situation and held 
a special hearing in Karachi. As hundreds turned up outside the court, police had a hard time containing them. Those who managed to get inside the court kept shouting and screaming. One woman went up to the rostrum and pounded her fist like this. And she asked the same question that thousands have been asking for years and years, where is my son? Tell me if you have killed him. How did the Chief Justice respond? I quote from a report from yesterday's Dawn newspaper. The Chief Justice expressed sympathy with the applicants and said that they should be informed about the fate of their relatives. He observed that it was not necessary that all of the missing persons had been picked up by law enforcement agencies, as some of them might have met with accidents or been kidnapped due to personal enmity. However, the emotionally charged applicants disturbed the proceedings, scuffled with police personnel, and a woman pounded the rostrum with fists. The Chief Justice withdrew to his chamber, but later reappeared in the courtroom and expressed displeasure over the attitude of the relatives of missing persons. The Chief Justice asked an up applicant how dared she pound the rostrum, adding that he would have sent her to jail for committing contempt of court if she was not a woman. She extended an apology. Remember, this woman was pounding the rostrum and asking, where is my son? I don't want to comment and be in contempt of the highest court in Pakistan. And I'm not even a woman, so I don't think I stand much of a chance. Now, I don't know many of you in this hall, so my apologies if I have hurt anybody's feelings. From experience, I can say that there is someone in these gatherings who has to report back to the authorities. If one of you has that duty tonight, please do note that we have only named very few people, and only those who are truly and completely dead now. No names have been named, no institutions have been maligned, nothing has been said against the integrity of Pakistan or its excellent institutions. Please be kind and add in your communique that I may not always agree with God or our government, but I fear both because I really, really don't want to become a missing person. Wama alayna illa al Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to ask uh, Anissa one or two questions, and then we're going to really quickly open it out to, uh, to those of you who are present. Um, I mean, to be honest, I was really off maps by what you were describing. I really had no idea about the scale of uh, what's happening. And I've read about, I guess, like a lot of a lot of this I've read about some of the, the higher profile cases, the university students or the teachers or some of the journalists that are in the international scale. To what extent, um, I mean, does international um, exposure or international pressure help? Or does it hinder? Because there are names and names and institutions that are named. Well, it has to It has, so it has to be. It has to be. I think it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, I was. I don't talk much about it. But I was uh, talking to a young man. So he was telling me about this, and this is just last month. So the families know now from their experience that the only hope is that they don't talk about it. There was almost a standard procedure that if somebody got abducted, you will at least try and register a case. Police didn't register a case, you will go to a court, you will appeal a court. Uh, you will call up the Human Rights Commission of uh, uh, Pakistan. You will try to find a uh, late Asma Dhangi number from somewhere. Uh, now, uh, and this is just an anecdote that I have not carried out yet. Uh, that if this happens to you, then you shut up and stay home. 
you don't report anywhere. And the chances are that you might get the question back. And a couple of people have had this happen this week. They said, we did not go to the police, we did not call anybody, we did not even engage our neighbors, and after 10 days, uh, uh, the person uh, came back. So I think the, the total and complete uh, submission So we have um, elections of you in, uh, in a month's time. Um, is any... <laughs> I'll that um, you maybe can hold that one for, for a minute. Um, is, is any of the political parties, uh, does, this, is, does this register on a manifesto or on a platform or a policy? Is anybody talking about this? I think uh, my friends who are trying to cover in day-to-day -day elections, they might tell me, but from what I know, none of the main political parties, there's a new strong political party, uh, it's the Spoon Guys movement, uh, they have been holding a large uh, rallies across Pakistan, the government is trying to get up to stop them, the media won't even mention their name, uh, but that is one of their main demands, and some of the members are contesting the elections, uh, but I'm, uh, I can't, uh, I, I don't think any of the major political parties that goes across, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the centrist parties, the religious parties, uh, I, I don't think they need this. Uh, this and this is really funny for me. Um, so there are, you know, there's a big international press call um, all over Pakistan for the elections. And would, would you say that the journalists who are working, or the Pakistani or the international journalists who are working for international outlets, do they also similarly get threatened by the intelligence, the military apparatus when they cover it? I mean, if, if there are advantages being provided in Islam, that you don't get threatened uh, in the same way that the, the local journalists would. But when they want to, I remember there was a, there was a New York Times report visiting Kota, a woman, uh, and they barged into her hotel room and took all her stuff away. And as for as I was trying to uh, punch her uh, around, she just kind of. Uh, but so, so I, I won't, uh, I won't like to say that oh, okay, this is there is a boundary that will not be uh, uh, crossed. In the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, two of our uh, women journalists, one was picked up and then released to the man's house was uh, ransacked, and they both believed that it was the same people and go around. So on the topic of hearts and minds and missing people, there is something that I've been trying to understand. Maybe if you can help me understand it better. Uh, it, it has been going on for a very long time, but it came to kind of public consciousness during the time of General Musharraf. It became a very hot issue, missing people. Uh, that's what everybody was talking about. And one Chief Justice you know, picked up that issue and then he got into hot water as well. Uh, but he was the villain. He was handing people over to Americans who were ending up in Guantanamo Bay. Yes. So he was selling people, mm. he was abducting people. Mm. But by the time of Rahil Sharif, the nation was thanking the general mm. for doing the same stuff. So how did he manage to win hearts and minds there? Same way he's winning hearts and minds in Yemen. <laughs> so something must be... I don't know who says that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the advertising is quite cheap in Pakistan. It doesn't take cover the city with ten to the eight sheet notes. If I had to have a few million, my account will see ten to any all over the city. It's easily done. I mean I I don't know which uh, where he won. I mean I maybe he did, but I have no evidence. I lived under his uh scene, so I've seen all those ten to uh, posters, but uh, you know, it's like me writing kind of things I made over and over again and thinking, oh look how how popular uh, I am. That's like sending who cares to yourself? I mean, people do that, you know, and are working. So, uh, I don't know, and you, and uh, I'm glad to mention the first Chief Justice who uh, picked it up, the Justice Sipakar Chaudhary, who referred So, for a few days, he was very active. Every day, they would go for it. Every 
every day. Uh, that's when the when the families were also active. And maybe if we if we find this case procedurally, that if we have all the evidence, and they have, most of them have like files this thick with affidavits and with kind of you know statements from from police officers and government officers that we take up to man and we hand it to them. So he would ask at every hearing that IGFC should appear in the court. And the, and the local, uh, I think we need an brigade type person who runs the operations, that he should appear. And uh, they would not appear. I'm sure they were busy people, they don't have the time for same things. And I still remember the the thing that Chaudhry uh, Sahib got very frustrated with one day. And he made this claim sitting in Kota. Uh, that if you like fear the day when I have to send an SHO, a police officer, to arrest a brigadier. And that was a laughable uh, notion. But that also clearly uh, draws a headline, I think. Uh, question is, uh, what in your opinion ought to be done? And by who? And of course, who are the media players that are pursuing this policy in terms of geopolitics and so on? Are you saying that there might be other countries involved? Is that what you're saying? No, no most definitely, yes. Because we hear about all the problems of power was involved in Afghanistan. Okay. And of course, we have to I just want to clarify. Go on, Nathan. Go for it. Thank you. I didn't really accept that premise that who is responsible for from saving us from Like, who is responsible for this? Really, it doesn't make it that this is intelligence to consider us their role. And now, you know, sometimes it's same way people tell us, oh, actually, these abductions, these things, these are foreign intelligence agencies who are doing this here. And how do you absolve yourself of the uh, responsibility? Uh, that you can't stop it. I mean, ultimately, responsibility lies uh, uh, with them. Uh, so I, I, I wish I could uh, uh, answer your question on what uh, you ought to be uh, uh, done. I think uh, we should at least, before we can get there, uh, we at least need to accept and acknowledge uh, that we have a serious humanitarian crisis at our hands. And by not doing that, I think we become complicit. It's very simple. You know, I can say that, oh, this is the geopolitical will. And this kind of thing these things happen. So, yeah, sure. So, unless it doesn't happen to me, I'm going to say, this is how states are run. And I think people who are doing it also believe that. So, in a way, we are you know, on the same page. There's not much of a, a, a conflict. Amongst the missing people, mm -hmm. is there a spectrum which we can identify? We know that there are such students, some of them, so on, but there are some very ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So why would that be happening to these ordinary people? For people who are really not. I think students are pretty ordinary people. If you go to a university, you're studying physics or, or medicine, I mean, they are uh, pretty uh, uh, ordinary. Patterns in Balochistan, for example, uh, if you are a Baloch, uh, if you are, if you've done like your metric and you're enrolled in university, trust me, like your life expectancy is reduced by half. I mean, that's, you can look at the stats and you see that this is uh, what happened. So, anybody who goes to you know, a university uh, without pretty size. I have friends who live in Quetta, and as soon as their their uh, uh, their children have died.
done their uh, O level, uh, they have, if they can afford, they have packed them off to Lahore. Because they know that my son goes to college, he's going to get to So, with them, we have that kind of situation. Uh, with the North, with the Pashtuns, uh, we've had a, probably a problem which is at much, much uh, bigger scale. Uh, and now, you used to think that Lahore, you know, sort of, for why would it uh, uh, happen in Lahore? There's no, as far as I know, there's no anti Pakistan movement in Lahore. Lahore is not to separate from Pakistan. Uh, although some people say that maybe that is the solution, maybe they do that, maybe we can have uh, So it's happening uh, in, uh, there uh, as well. I mean, a year ago, it was unthinkable. They would say, oh, this is like a problem with them. Uh, 
wondering whether it's barring the sort of private, the huge private academic institutions, is there some change in the way education institutions, the messages that are being sort of spread there, the kind of spaces that exist where students can be students and are sometimes, you know, their messages are misinterpreted. Is there some kind of maybe invisible or slightly visible attempt to change the educational structure itself to make it more state-friendly, if you like? Yes, uh, my name is Asma as well. Coming back to Asma, Johanny, indeed she was a very inspirational personality and I think she was exceptional. I want to ask, what was it that uh, survived, you know, she survived in school, doing and the that's happening in Pakistan? Uh, what was it that kept her going? And uh, maybe it's a naive question. Is there any uh, light in the tunnel <coughs> in terms of what's happening in Pakistan? Do we say, see any changes in the Google said, you know, every nation goes up, uh, comes down? I, I think we are just going down and down and down. Is there a way or is there any light in the tunnel? Are we going to come up or? First, your uh, question about universities. Uh, I think there is uh, still slightly a uh, visible change uh, that uh, you will see because even if somebody is uh, an A, we have way too few universities. I uh, don't know what's taught there is actually kind of this one made them to educated people or is it is it going to plan to at least uh, make them think about uh, you know sort of whatever goes on around them. Uh, but you will see that from every kind of uh, generation uh, there are uh, you know, students who come out of universities who are kind of you know more uh, engaged. At least I have seen more engaged people uh, in politics and public life than there ever was in my own uh, lifetime. So there is a uh, sort of a slightly. Uh, I don't know what uh, kept her uh, asthma uh, going. I think uh, a basic kind of uh, empathy uh, uh, that we are expected to have uh, as a sort of a, uh, for our fellow countrymen. Well, yeah, yes. I meant uh, in terms of safety net because she wasn't here, she died and she died. I mean, the way so she was. That's, that's the most depressing part about these discussions. That if you're still alive, then, you know, you should, like, you know, surely things are not so bad. Right? So, that what kept her uh, alive, I think, uh, I think her, her, her commitment, her ability is quite basic that you're living in a country. They know that I'm driving down the road, two miles down, there are people who are being kept as slaves. And the country does not allow slavery. There are laws which prohibit it. So her, her basic empathy, this thing is happening, and I will not uh, let this uh, happen. There is a peasant leader in my own hometown, Florida, who has uh, been accused of all kinds of things. And he was being kept in a solitary with her handcuff. And that was one of the last cases. She went to the Supreme Court, convinced the judge that you can't keep a man in solitary custody in, uh, with his uh, handcuff. Now, a judge said, yes, okay, remove his, uh, remove his handcuff. Now, an ordinary good person like me and you would say, hey, you know, victory. But no, she didn't stop there. He drove all the way to Bara, went to jail, because he knows the system. That they will receive orders, they will not do anything. They like, remove the handcuffs and front so, so, so that that's what made her exceptional and, and special. Yeah. You're not just you're not just some idealist who kind of talks things or fights cases. You know that uh, uh, that how our world works. Uh, where the levers of power are, and when you uh, you're not afraid of kind of uh, pressing them, uh, the lights. Uh, I was I was promised that there's a buffet at the end. <laughs> Thank you.
to Mohammed Hanif for um, a thought-provoking and illuminating discussion today. Um, thank you also to Hassan for chairing the event, um, to my colleague Misha, who's outside um, preparing the food um, for all her tireless work, and to all of you here um, for your perceptive questions and comments. We're so used to hearing about Pakistan's contested role in the war against terror, and what we have been privy to this evening is a valuable insight into the reality and complexity of geopolitical machinations and their impact of everyone connected to, to the lives of everyone connected to the project that is Pakistan. So, um, so as I said, in a moment we will retire to a buffet supper prepared by the renowned Pakistani caterer Sapna, um, during which I hope we can continue the conversations we've been having up until now. Before we do, I'd like to, I'd like to close by saying a few words about the Muslim Institute. So we're a fellowship society um, of thinkers uh, promoting and supporting the growth of knowledge, creativity, and open debate within Muslim communities and beyond. Our aim is to celebrate diversity and plurality of thought and to provide a forum for critical thought and the sharing of ideas. So how do we do this? We do this through our events, such as tonight's annual Ibn Rush lecture. In the past, our lectures have addressed topics as varied as multiculturalism in, in an age of Brexit and Trump, which was delivered last year by Lord Bhikkhu Parekh, and between Ghazali and Ibn Rushd ethics, reason and humility, which was delivered by Professor Ibrahim Musa. We also publish Critical Muslim. Um, you can see some copies on the table there. Um, a quarterly edited volume of essays and reflections. So do have a look at our current issue, Gastronomy. Um, highlights include halal food, from organic farms to fried chicken shops, and the cultural significance of traditional cuisine from Azerbaijan to Baghdad to Nigeria. And we'll be launching our upcoming issue, Beauty, next week at the Bradford Literature Festival, so do look out for that too. We have an annual winter gathering. This year it takes place on the 16th to the 18th of November, and we'll explore the theme, Futures, looking at the endless possibilities and challenges that will impact the Muslim world and our understanding of Islam in the light of technological advance, climate change, and transformations to the way in which we live our lives. So why is the work that we do relevant? So I've been involved with the Muslim Institute for seven years now, most recently as director. And what I've seen is the dissemination of those ideas we discuss at our events permeating into wider society. I've tangibly seen a shift in attitudes 
towards plurality and critical thinking in our understanding of Islam and the Muslim world. There is a long, long way to go. But genuinely, this is an exciting time for those of us who wish to challenge dogma and reject the notion of blind imitation. So what we do is we provide a platform for the vibrancy of thinking and ideas that already exist and which sadly has been overshadowed by the absolutism of some Islamic gatekeepers and by Islamophobic sentiments um, which continue to fester in so many sectors. So we're making those dynamic conversations that many of us hold in private visible and heard, which is vital in our contemporary context because if you have a seemingly unchanging and unchallenged stereotype, you won't see signs of change. The Muslim Institute exists to provide a space for these conversations, to challenge the consequences of damaging trends through rigorous debate in an inclusive and welcoming environment. So please sign up as a fellow, join us, and be a part of this movement to celebrate critical thought. Thank you.